For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the divisions of the soul, of spirit, of joints, and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Hebrews 4.12, your fellow redeemed. Relevant. Relevant. I looked the word up, and according to Wikipedia, which is on the internet, so of course it's correct, means appropriate to what is being done. Relevant. Appropriate to what is being done. Practical. Another Wikipedia definition for you. Practical. Of or concerned with the actual doing or use of something rather than theory or idea. And let's go for another fun word. Relatable, which means able to relate to something else. Kind of a lazy definition, but it gets it across. Able to relate to something else. Now, these words are often used and talked about, especially in church settings, when people are considering what the Bible has to say about something. The question is asked, okay, fine, you bring up this biblical point, or you direct my attention to this section of scripture, but is it relevant to my life? Is it practical? Is it relatable to what's going on with me right now? To be honest, those are fair questions. In view of them, I would like to state this with no apology whatsoever, and I know you agree with me on this. There's absolutely nothing in your life more relevant, practical, or relatable than God. Nothing. God is the top, God is the foundation, and God fills all things. If God is who he says he is, and if God has done and is doing what he says he is doing, then you will never tire of God. You will never be out of need with God. You will never go beyond God, ever, period. And therefore, God then becomes the most relevant, practical, relatable thing person in your life. Think about this. We're going to spend some time in the book in Colossians. There is a book inspired by the Holy Spirit who moved the Apostle Paul to pen this book, this four-paged letter to this church in Colossae some 2,000 years ago. And by no surprise, it speaks to concerns and issues that you and I are facing as 21st century Americans living in the United States. Think about it. For example, here's some issues we face, and the Lord clearly talks about in the book of Colossians. People in general want to know what works, right? We want to know, is this practical for me? We want to see solid deliverables from what we spend our time and energy on, in, or even with. So if you're going to encourage me to try something, If you're going to tell me a certain product is good for me, you're going to tell me a certain idea, and I put that idea into motion, it's going to help my life to some extent. I want deliverables. I want to know, is that really true? Do you have any evidence for that, any practical application? Can this idea, can this product carry its own weight? Okay. Could we say the same about Christianity? We want to know, does it work? Does Christ really change your life? Can Christ really bring joy and peace and happiness and forgiveness and meaning and purpose into your life right now? Well, the Apostle Paul said in the book of Colossians, verse, or chapter 1, verse 21, And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. Jesus has now reconciled you in his body and flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Or how about this? The apostle says Christ changes you. He says, therefore, as you received Christ the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in faith just as you were taught abounding in thanksgiving. 
In Colossians chapter 3, beginning of verse 16, you have some of the beautifulest look at the kind of relationships we have in life, our work relationships, our marital relationships, our friendship and family relationships, and how Christ now redefines them. Deliverables. Oh, Jesus brings the deliverers. Deliverables. Only Jesus can bring love, joy, peace, and forgiveness. All that is good, all that is healthy, all that is right. It's Jesus who brings it into your life. You were created to live this way. Because of sin, we we fell off. We fell off the mark. We stepped out of that relationship that we were made for. But Jesus sets it right that you can glorify, magnify, and praise God in your thought, words, and actions. And by the way, a side bonus of this is you become very good and very productive to those in your life, those around you. Okay, how about this one? Your relatability the practicality of what the Lord is saying to the book of Colossians. You've seen the bumper sticker, Coexist. It's got like all these little religious symbols on there. And it's almost as if the bumper sticker is saying, and maybe this is just me reading this into the bumper sticker, but it's like saying, hey, if all religions are the same anyway, just just get along, you know. You take that path, you take this path, he takes this path. So what? Now, by the way, I'm all for people getting along, don't get me wrong. But each religion makes its own set of truth claims. But there's this push. There's this push in our culture, and there always has been this push to just put all religions together. What's it matter? Who cares? What what would that look like? If all these groups of people make these truth claims and they all come together, what does that even look like? Who's the head of it? Who's in charge? Who's the top? Who's, Who's God? Because religions make very different claims about who God is and what God does. Is religion just about goodwill among people at the end of the day, here on earth? Well, here's what Paul tells us in the book to Colossae. And Jesus, he is head of the body, the church. Jesus is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that everything in him might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Jesus is the head of the church. Jesus is the only way to heaven. He is the truth. He is the life. He is the path. There's no other way to the Father except through Christ. Okay, how about this? We live in a very philosophical age. People are thinking. Information is doubling continually. People take a philosophical approach. If, if, if you enter intellectual circles, if you claim, and this is intellectual suicide, if you claim that there's absolute truth, that there's objective truth, it's not subjective, you might get laughed out of there. Because authority, and absolute authority, is suspect. In fact, the popular thinking is there's no rules, there's just experience. Morals are fluid. They change The masses agree upon what should be considered moral, and then that is subject to change. Frederick Nietzsche, in his landmark book, where he writes, God is dead, he's wrong, but he writes in The Will to Power that morality is set by those in power, right? Is that what it's all about? So therefore, Jesus isn't God. His word is not binding. He certainly didn't become God, become man to save us. Is that it? Well, here's what the book of Colossians says. Speaking of Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Or how about this? For in him the fullness of the deity dwells bodily. Jesus is God Almighty. Jesus is truth. He is the creator, he is the sustainer, and he is the savior of our very souls. One more, one more. One more point on the relevant, practical relatability of the power of God's word. This book specifically, and like I said, beginning in chapter 3, talks about relationships. We would all agree that relationships are incredibly important. In fact, it's not impossible and happens probably far too often than we care to admit 
Somebody can be in a marriage and feel lonely because the relationship is strained. Somebody can be part of a family and feel isolated because the bridges that were once built, that there was free flowing conversation and connection have been broken. Somebody could be part of work and feel out of sync with those that they are in relationship to. Colossians speaks to this. It speaks to husbands and wives. It speaks to children and parents. It speaks to employers and employees. Christ changes Everything. Christ is the builder of marriage. He's the builder of families. He's the builder of friendships. Christ is the source of truth and goodness and understanding, and he is the power to forgive each other. And we need that power. With all this in mind, let's begin our look at the book of Colossians. We'll start in chapter 1, verse 1 through 8. You can find it if you'd like the text printed in the service bulletin. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, on this you have heard before in word and of truth the gospel which has come to you and is indeed in the whole world and it is bearing fruit and increasing as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God and truth just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in spirit. So far, these are the very words of God acknowledging that these are the words of God. They are not the words of man and thanking God that he has preserved these words for us, and he promises to bless us as we spend time in these words that end, we pray. Sanctify us by your truth, O Lord. Your word is truth. Amen. So the Apostle Paul starts out this incredible letter the way he starts out pretty much all his letters, the typical Pauline approach. You see, in our culture, you write, Dear such and so, and at the end of the letter, you identify yourself as the writer if you have any sense of courtesy. Whereas in Paul's time, you, the writer, identified yourself first. So he is Paul. He's speaking not of his own authority. He says he is Paul, an apostle from the Lord Jesus Christ. This is significant. Paul is saying, the words I'm writing to come not from the counsels of men, are not dictated in the higher learning of individuals or within myself. They are from God. I'm speaking God's word. Therefore, God's authority is what's carried in these words, not mine. An apostle means somebody that's sent forth. So if a king were to uh, send forth somebody to deliver a message, that individual delivering the message of the king would be just like if the king was delivering the message to you. So Paul delivering this message is God sending his words to the people. As was his custom, Paul would mention, and he did this in a number of letters, he mentioned those with him. In this case, Timothy is with him. Now, don't think Timothy is a co-author. Timothy was not a co-author. Timothy was there. Holy Spirit's the author. Paul is the chosen penman. But Paul had a pattern of identifying the person with him. In this case, it was Timothy. You read some of the other letters, especially the Corinthians, will get some pretty cool name ideas. They were with Paul when he wrote The church in Colossae is also a, it's a very interesting place. It's interesting because Paul didn't, Paul did not, he was not the founder of this church. And his missionary journeys, Paul founded several churches. He did not found or find or establish the one in Colossae. In fact, as far as we know, he never physically even went to the church at all. Now, Paul says it's Epaphras who presumably came and heard Paul preach the gospel, perhaps when he was in Ephesus. And then Epaphras took that beautiful gospel message and shared it with people in Laodicea, in Hierapolis, and also in Colossae. In fact, Epaphras is the pastor to these people in Colossae, and he is so concerned about them. He's so thankful for the Lord working in their life, but there is a matter of great interest and great concern that he travels from Asia Minor all the way over to Rome to visit Paul, who is currently under house arrest. 
he brings the beautiful message that the gospel has created faith in the hearts of these people. And Christ is changing lives. He's taking dead, separated sinners, and he's bringing them into the house and the family of God, heading for eternal life in the presence of Christ. This is the most joyous thing you can hear. Ever since Jesus rose from the dead, the gospel, the good news, the glad tidings about his life and what it means is spreading. Christ's followers, as you know, would go to one town, they'd preach the gospel. If they were rejected, if the people didn't want it, if they were visibly or physically forced out of town, they left. They went to the next town, and they spread, and they shared the gospel. Where the Holy Spirit moved the hearts of the people, they established a congregation there. So the tone of this letter really is one of thankfulness. Paul is thankful that the Lord's saving truth of forgiveness in Christ is taking root, changing lives, and bringing peace and joy and forgiveness into the lives of individuals. So Epaphras informs Paul of what's going on. He would later inform him, of course, some of the problems, and that's what Paul is going to be addressing later on in the letter. But at this point in the introduction, Paul is rejoicing in the fact that he can call these people his fellow saints. Now let's talk about the word saint just for clarity's sake. Some misunderstanding about the word saint. It's not just talking about a football team. So let's just put that one on the rest. Saint really just means set apart. It means someone that's set apart from other people. So it's not talking about super Christians who have done so many good things that they can give you their good things by some vehicle of transference organized through the church. No, no, no. Saints are those set apart by the grace of God. They're believers in Jesus, set apart in this world, who fear, love, and trust in God above all things. Those are saints. You are saints. You believe in Christ. You are a saint. The Apostle Paul's move with joy. Look at verse 4. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for all saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, that's a key verse. We're going to close out the sermon talking about that. Verse 6. Of this you have heard before the word, before in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world. It is bearing fruit, increasing as it also does among you since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God and truth. Paul is saying, I am so thankful Christ has come into your life. Christ is changing your life, changing the way you view and act and operate in this world, and it is motivated by love. Love is the defining attribute. Loved by Christ means you are now lovers of God and lovers of other people as well, and that is being seen in the fruits that you bear, in the way that you live your life. Now let's address something. This faith in Christ leads to the hope of eternal salvation that is ours. You do not, you have the eternal salvation right now. Your name is written in the book of life. The Bible shares that with us. But you are not going to walk into heaven and hang out for an afternoon and then come back to your home or job or whatever it is you do. That has led some to try to state that Christianity really is just some massive form of escapism. They say this. They say, your faith in Jesus, because you don't see him, you don't talk to him, you talk to him in prayer, but you're not looking at him eye to eye, physical eye to eye, and your hope in heaven, which is not visibly present, heaven that is, only works then to distract you from living in the present. It's a form of escapism of how you deal with your current struggles Now you retreat away to your little corner and talk to your imaginary friend and feel good about the happy place you might go to. So let me ask you this. I'm just going to ask this. When a Christian's heart is set on Christ, when a person's eyes are so fixed on the Lord and they're fixed on his will, there's this deep abiding trust that Christ has freed them from the curse of sin. And that the goodness of God is flowing through their life. Their life is centered and built on this. That heaven and eternity are theirs. Is that person of no earthly use? Is that person unproductive in their life currently? Do they then become, because of all the things I mentioned, self-centered, lost in an island on themselves, thinking about them and what's good for them and what's going on for them and ignoring the present struggles of this current life. I'll let C.S. Lewis answer that. Here's how C.S. Lewis would answer it. You know the quote. Aim for heaven 
and you'll get earth thrown in. Aim for earth, you get neither. I'll say this. You don't really know the Bible if you think it's some form of escapism. Listen to how the Lord talks. We embrace reality. We become part of the world we live in. Look at people like Daniel who embraced a pagan culture and brought the gospel. Look at how Jesus sends out the disciples to preach the gospel, to live and work among people and share Jesus. And he says, carry each other's burdens. That is embracing the present if there ever was any. In fact, we live with a confidence in the promises of the Lord and the joy that we have over salvation that frees us frees us from a self-centered living, frees us from being controlled by regret and self-pity and fear and bitterness and laziness and impatience and envy. We are freed from these things because of the love Christ has for us. Freedom from that list of things I just read is some of the most relevant, practical, and relatable of topics we could ever have. How about this? One more thought for you on this subject. Can you name at least three people that you know that are so taken up with heaven and Jesus that they're totally unproductive people. But you have three people. You call them right now on the phone and they're like, can't talk to you. I am so enraptured in prayer, I don't even know what's going on. Do you know those three people? Do you you know even one? I can't name one. I can't name someone I know that's so taken up with the study of God's word meditating in God's word, being all about the Lord, that they are so unproductive to the rest of the world. I I can't even name one. The real problem is actually the little amount of time spent with God, reading his word, speaking to him in prayer, sharing him with others. It's easy to get wrapped up in what we think is going on right now in our immediate future. C.S. Lewis would call this the tyrant of the urgent Whatever is happening now is of absolute importance. Whatever is the trendy thought now, i got to be a part of. The tyrant of the urgent. You see, the reality is this. Jesus brings the greatest and most production in us. It's a fruit of the Spirit working in us. Because of his goodness living in your heart, it overflows into your life. And the love that you have for God, the love that you have for your fellow man, the love and the gifts that God gives you to use in your work life, your relationship life, all of that is the grace of God working. And you become, again, one of the most productive people there is. So as we unfold the letter of Colossians, we pray for the Lord's blessing, that he continues to bless us in the real, that we are saved and loved by Christ, and that by his grace he uses us to share that truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.